Thank you for your prayers for our high school missions trip. They returned last night safely, had an incredible time, had a phenomenal time. God answered many prayers. Can we thank God for this last week? <clears throat> You'll hear lots of stories. They went to Idaho, served there. Uh, one thing I love about this missions trip is it really came from a passion. One of our seniors who had been on missions trip as a student, as a younger kid, uh, changed his life, and he really wanted to see this happen. So Mike worked with Jesse Peters, our student ministry pastor. It really came together. There was a lot of training, weeks of training, and I believe what happened not just during the last week, but for these students for the rest of their lives and their walk with God. It was very significant. So thank you for your prayers. Uh, we thank God together. Also, we have some very good news. Uh, we have an adult ministry pastor who's going to be joining our staff team. And we are thrilled. We are thrilled. Many of you have been praying for a while. This is Paul Reed, his wife, Jen. Now, they're moving from Ohio, so they have a house to sell. Prayers appreciated. And then they're looking for the right spot here. You know that transition. You probably moved a few times and had to go through that. Pray for them. Uh, Mid-August is ideal that he would be here serving. And we have life groups at the core of our church. There's about 50 groups, about 500 people. It's give and take. But life groups are the best way to connect at Grace. Paul's primary role is going to be guiding the life groups and seeing that ministry flourish. And you also think of classes, middle-sized groups. There's a lot to adult ministry, and this is really an answer to prayer. We've waited and prayed, and we are thrilled. You'll meet Paul before long, but uh, this is a great blessing from the Lord, and it feels like kind of a new season, great timing as we head into the fall as well. Today we are in Psalm 57, if you brought a Bible or if you want to find the Bible on your phone, right? We're so blessed to have Bibles available. If you need a Bible, let us know, we'll give you a hard copy. And we're going through the Psalms with the theme of refresh. God refreshes us in deep ways like no one else can. And we go through difficult situations. We're seeing in the Psalms different situations and different responses. We're always choosing our responses to the situations that we face. Today, this situation is when people are against you. Have you ever had people against you? Undermining you, slandering you. You ever been in that situation? David knows about this situation. And this is where God will meet us, encourage us, and empower us. In fact, I believe when people are against you, that is a prime time to really draw close to God and experience him in new ways. And God moves sometimes in our weaknesses, sometimes when we're overwhelmed. That's when we really see the power of God. That's what we see in Psalm 57. Let's pray. Father, we glorify you. We praise you. May you be exalted today. God, you are close and you are imminent and you are transcendent. You are above the heavens. You are greater than our challenges and than our problems. God, when we're stuck, we give you praise and then we move forward by faith. God, I pray we would do that together as we honor you in this place, as we trust you together. God, we'll give you all the glory that you deserve. And God, I pray anyone today who feels overwhelmed, God, we would seek you, draw near to you. There would be healing. There would be hope. There would be an empowerment through the Holy Spirit today. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Life can quickly shift from calm to chaos. Have you had that experience before where things are going smoothly and David was serving? David was serving King Saul. King Saul had depression. He had bouts of despair. King David was a, he had an instrument and he would bring music and Saul the king would be soothed. David was faithful in service. David was also faithfully serving his nation. David stood up when others were shrinking back. When Goliath roared, David didn't back down, but he had faith in God, and there was a victory over Goliath. David served God. He was serving the king. He was serving the troops, bringing them snacks. He was serving his nation. He was serving his God. He was faithful. Sometimes even when you're faithful people will turn against you. And David, as he was serving and many things were going smoothly and there were many victories, suddenly it went sideways. Because King Saul, and it started on the inside and then it overflowed on the outside, King Saul was jealous of David. In jealousy and envy that started on the inside, now he wanted to kill David. Some people resent you first on the inside before you even know it. They've been carrying bitterness for weeks or months, and you didn't even have a clue. You're just like, 
hey bro, what's up sis? You're giving a hug and as you're giving that hug, they have things in their heart that are against you they've been harboring. Saul is harboring those interior motives. He was harboring a spirit that wasn't coming from God and then eventually it came out. When someone's against you, it will come out. It's just a matter of time. They can try to stuff it and act spiritual and act nice and smile on the other, but God knows their heart and it will come out. It's not fun when it comes out. It really isn't fun, but God saw it coming the whole time. David didn't see it coming, so it was a shock. It was a surprise. Sometimes it feels sudden, like what's going on? But Saul had been harboring this in his heart. Now David is literally running for his life. He's running for his life because Saul wants to take him down and Saul wants to take him out. Maybe you've had some experiences with someone who wanted to take you down and you were running for space, you were running for help, you were running for relief. David is running for his life. Psalm 57, this is not a psalm where David is comfortable, he's cushy, and he thinks, hmm, let me just grab my coffee and write a psalm today. It's just a nice day to write some scripture. And, and that's not what he's doing. He doesn't have his song list on. He, he doesn't have his comfortable chair. David is running for his life. And it's a reminder as we read the Bible, these are real people, real situations, really crying out to God. And in Psalm 57, it reminds us we can really cry out to a real God. And in any situation, any time, God is available. God is there. When people are against you, God is still for you. So seek the Lord just like David's seeking God. Here's a few truths when people are against you. The first is that people will be against you because of your calling, your gifting, your anointing, and your pursuing God. You say, well, those are good things. To have a calling, a gifting, an anointing, to be pursuing God, those are all good things. Yes, let me make it very clear. People will be against you even because of the good things the good things that you're doing. You are gifted, you are called. When there's an anointing on your life, not everyone's gonna understand and appreciate that. And when you pursue God, not everyone wants to go with you. Some people are gonna try to slow you down and sidetrack you. Well, look at verse one. David cries out, have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on me, for in you my soul takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. He's realistic. He says, this is a disaster that's going on. Well, what kind of disaster? He is fleeing from Saul and he's running to the cave. The first cave is in 1 Samuel chapter 22 and it's Adullam. And he runs into this cave. And what's interesting is that God provides about 400 people to rally around him. It's kind of a new community, and these are people who are discouraged, disenfranchised. They're in debt. Look at this community that God raises up. When you have people against you, God will raise up some allies. He'll raise up some people who will bolster you in your faith. God will, might bring some surprise friends, and you're like, who is this? And this person shows up, and another one shows up. So now he's got this group of about 400 misfits, You know, it doesn't matter that the successful people are rejecting him in the palace. He's got his misfits. You know, you just run with the people that God provides, and God provides 400 for David, the king. And and now he's in Adullam as the king wants to kill him. Then he goes to another cave in Gedi. This is 1 Samuel 24. You say, what happens here? Now it's not just Saul that wants to kill him, but Saul has mobilized the army. We have three thousand of Saul's troops wanting to kill David who's on the run. He's in the cave. Can you imagine, not just that one person wants to take you out, but now 3,000 hitmen are after you. You've got no big army. You've got no defense. Do you ever feel like you're up against something that's just way bigger than you? And in your own strength, you can't turn it around or face it. 3,000 are coming. He's in this cave in En Gedi. And again, all of the trauma that comes with this. Life is no longer smooth and calm. Now it's chaotic. Now he's on the run. Now he's outnumbered. Now he's going from cave to cave. How do you think he felt? And can you relate? Ever feel scared? Kind of stunned? Sad? Slandered? 
alone, in danger, hunted, undermined, misunderstood. The army is after him. And yet, God is with him. There was victory in serving. There's victory over Goliath. Now there's victory in the battles. There were victory in the battles. They created a new song. Well, Saul has killed his thousands. David, his tens of thousands. How do you think that felt to King Saul, who saw himself as all alone at the top of the food chain, and they come up with a little song that says, yeah, you know, Saul does a few things. David, oh, David does thousands of great things for our nation. That was ringing, that new song is ringing in Saul's ears. Not only that, but God is with David, Saul is starting to rebel. He's starting to slip. If you're walking with God and there's someone who's starting to slip a little bit, they might see you and get jealous. They might see you and get envious. They might see you and think, why is God for them? I want God for me, not for them. And Saul, anyone who's selfish, anyone that's over controlling, anyone that's overbearing like Saul, God's glory starts to fade. And then young David, who's pure and has integrity, God is with him. And Saul, seeing all of this happen, the jealousy is building up. And there's also a spiritual battle. If you read your Bible or you've lived long enough, you know there's a spiritual battle. There's a real devil, there's real demons. These are fallen angels. Well, what does this devil want to do? He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what evil is all about. Evil wants to come into your life and steal, kill, and destroy. Well, who's the devil? He's an accuser. He wants to accuse you and take you down with shame and guilt. What else? He's an opposer. He wants to block you from faithfully serving God and glorifying God with all your gifts to the full. Well, what else? He's an oppressor. He wants to torment you. We have an enemy. The enemy is not each other. The enemy, it's the, it's the devil. And we have a spiritual battle. We need God's help. The Holy Spirit in us is greater than the one who's in the world. We turn to God who's greater than the devil. The devil, his story, we know his future. He's thrown in the lake of fire. We don't have to walk in fear for a minute. All this is happening, and there is a spiritual battle, as you think of the kings of Israel and the story of David. All this is unfolding together. David is anointed. He's going to be the next king. He's talented on the battlefield as a leader, as a musician. There's a calling on his life. He has a closeness with God. And when you add all that up, there's a target on his back. If you really want to seek God and glorify God, there's this target that gets formed on your back. There's a target on your back if you want to lead and step up, if you want to be bold, if you want to have conviction in this culture, if you want to be countercultural, if you want to live for Jesus, there'll be a target on your back at work and around your neighborhood. And that's just the reality of the spiritual battle. It's always been that way, and it always will be that way. Sometimes we have false expectations, don't we? That if we just follow Jesus, well, and besides, we're Americans, so we have all these rights Between my expectations and my rights, I don't think I'm ever going to have a hard day. Well, Jesus continually had people against him. There was no bigger target on anyone's back than on Jesus' back. And it's a reminder that if you follow Jesus, you will have people against you. Now, I do want to point out that many Christians cry out persecution when in fact they're just being rude. Have you ever seen Christians be rude or obnoxious? And they get this little martyrdom thing going, like they're all against me. No, you just made some bad decisions. (laughs) I can't believe this world. See that they're all trying to take me out. No, you just didn't handle that situation well. (laughs) So again, let's not call everything oppression and spiritual battle and martyrdom when it's really like we should just grow and develop and do some things better. Like, like that's true too. I don't want to take that out of this passage. In this particular situation, uh, David's not in denial. He's not playing games. He's serving. He's faithful. And there's people against him. And you will often have a demotion before a promotion. You will often have opposition before a promotion. The death will come before the resurrection in the gospel. Jesus will humble himself, become obedient, even on a cross. 
human, sinless, murdered, lays down his life, no greater agony, forsaken, all of that precedes the resurrection. And so often in life, you will go down before you go up, you will humble yourself before God exalts you, and people will mistreat you before God redeems and vindicates as well. It's all for his glory. Just be prepared that there's often opposition before a promotion. There's a lot of opposition when you wanna be faithful to God. As we look through the scriptures, there's many inspiring examples. And lean into the Bible and those who have gone ahead of us. Nehemiah in chapter two, as he steps into the city, it's a city that needed rebuilding. And Nehemiah sensed God's call to rebuild the city and unite the people, turning to God, rebuilding the wall. He says in chapter two, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me in what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. The context, they're coming back from exile and Babylon. They're gonna rebuild the city. We need people today who wanna rebuild cities and communities in the places devastated like Nehemiah. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. People are gonna mock and ridicule you when you're serving God. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. They are gonna serve God and be steadfast. Sanballat, Tobiah, and others are gonna show up. There's gonna be a couple of people that it just feels like at every turn, do I have to deal with Sanballat again? Tobiah's showing up, Sanballat's comments, Tobiah's intimidation. You're gonna have a Sanballat and Tobiah that just kind of shadow you through the whole project, Nehemiah, but keep rebuilding the city and the walls. He overcomes it. Joseph in the Old Testament mistreated by his family. His own brothers throw him into a pit. He's taken into slavery. Sometimes it's your family that's gonna mistreat you, misunderstand you, and malign you. But Joseph stayed faithful. God raised him up. There was the opposition, but then there's the promotion. And there he was in a position to provide food and see many people saved and point people to God as he forgave the ones who mistreated him and acknowledged that God turned it for the good. Mary, the mother of Jesus, misunderstood, maligned in her community, virgin, right? Like, when has that ever happened? (laughs) We're believing that one. (laughs) We know you and Joseph. No, she was faithful. She's the mother of Jesus. You see, in these examples, there's gonna be people against you. Sometimes it's gonna be a couple of people, like a Sam Ballot and a Tobiah. Sometimes it's gonna be your own family, like Joseph. And sometimes it's gonna be a community. It's gonna be a community of people and they might even be religious people and they might say they're people of faith, but the community just doesn't get God's calling and anointing on your life. And these people don't understand it and they actually get in the way and they even slow you down. But you're gonna trust God and continue to go because like those candles on birthday cakes that when you blow them and they go out and then you just wait and the light comes back, God will continue to reignite your flame. God will reignite your flame. They will say something, God will reignite your flame. They will try to take something away from you, God will reignite your flame. They will gossip about you, God will reignite your flame because there's a calling and there's an anointing on your life that no person can stop. This is from God, it's true for David, it's true for you. I remember not long ago sharing a quote that traveled around social media and I just wanted to declare the gospel and I was saying Christianity is not a dead religion. This is a vibrant relationship with the living God. Jesus is risen. And as that spread around social media, uh, on the one hand there's an excitement because any time in any way you can spread the gospel there's excitement. But then realistically there were just venomous comments for weeks for weeks, I found myself like the first week 
kind of laughing at a lot of it. And then the second week is like, they're still going? And the third week was like, wow, there's a lot of hatred towards Jesus and anyone that will proclaim Jesus boldly in this culture. And that's just the reality, that the more you want to move the kingdom forward, the more people are going to show up with some shade. That's the reality. It's always been that way. And David is going to move things forward for the nation of Israel. He's a big upgrade from where Saul's at. But at the same time, there's going to be people rising up, in this case, 3,000 to take him down. This is what David learned, and this is what may we learn this as well. When people are against you, talk with God. When people are against you, and they will be, talk with God. Talk with God. Start to thank God. Start to praise God. And then if you notice anything about the Psalms so far, this is the pattern that I see, I think, that is so healthy spiritually. Tell God your experiences, what you're going through, your situation. Then tell God your feelings, and then tell God your thoughts. That's what you do when people mistreat you. You tell God, you say, God, here's my situation. This is what I'm going through. This is what they're saying about me. This is the situation. Then you tell God your feelings. So this is how it's making me feel. This is where I'm at right now. And then tell God your thoughts. God, I'm thinking about responding this way. I'm thinking about doing this. The Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you. And it's okay to say, God, I can't walk through this, but come Holy Spirit and lead comfort and guide and empower me because I trust you, Holy Spirit. You're so much greater than situations like this. See, that's the beauty of the Psalms. David goes through it so we can learn. And we say, how does David go through that? 3,000 people want to kill you today? Well, what does he do? He thanks God. He praises God. Tells God about his situation. And then he shares his feelings. He shares his thoughts. And he asks for God's help. God will be with you. And as you pray, as you seek God, God is going to show up in the most difficult times. Look at verse 2. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends his love and his faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I lie among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth and spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Call on the one who saves, rebukes, loves, and fulfills his purposes. God does a lot when we call on him. Say, what is he doing here? What is he doing now? He saves, he rescues, he rebukes, he loves us, he fulfills his purpose as well. Spurgeon said, our faith does not deserve mercy, but it always wins it from the sovereign grace of God when it's sincere. When you're sincere and contrite and you're crying out to God, God hears you, God is merciful, God treats us better than we deserve. And that's the goodness of our God. David says as he's starting out, I take refuge under your wings. One Bible commentary said, it's like the mother bird that puts her wings over her little ones. On the one hand, the wings are there to protect the little ones because she senses danger, and also the wings are there so that they'll feel her warmth. Jesus, as a shepherd, looked at Jerusalem and the pain, and he longed to gather Jerusalem together in his love, in his protection. Many rejected or resisted this good shepherd. Don't resist the good shepherd. Now, in addition to starting out you know, under God's wings, Now David's requesting that God would rebuke. Have you ever asked God to rebuke someone? He's asking God to rebuke. God, they're more powerful than I am. Listen to the description. They're like lions. They're like beasts. They're ravenous. Their teeth are like spears. Their tongues are like swords. They dig pits. They spread nets. In other words, there's traps and there's danger. Everywhere I go, they want to take me out. Well, Moses is someone that learned to cry out to God. He didn't do that as much his first 80 years. You know, he, he really made it about himself. 
And then he really stepped back and kind of no way. And then the last third of his life, he learned to cry out to God. He learned that when Pharaoh comes and Pharaoh doesn't keep his word, that when Pharaoh wants to take out God's people, when Pharaoh wants to keep the slavery going, because Moses cried out to God, he saw God's presence and power. He even sensed God's peace in the middle of some storms. The plagues came, there was a rescue. He stayed faithful, he was steadfast. And it's an example of someone who learns how to call out to God. You might feel like you're not a very good prayer. Prayer doesn't come natural. It's never been your go-to. You get stuck. You don't know what to say. When things get hard, you're just a person of action. You do things. You don't pray. God wants to grow us in prayer. And if you're looking to grow in prayer, look at Moses' prayers. Look what happens in the last third of his life. Say, it's too late for me to learn about prayer. That should have happened when I was in Awanas. That should have happened, you know, when I was in college. That should have happened my first 10 years in the life group. Okay, it hasn't happened yet, but it's gonna happen. It's a relationship with the living God. And part of that relationship is learning how to talk and cry out to God. God's gonna free you up in your spirit to listen to God more, to talk to God more, to grow in this relationship. It's gonna become more full and relational and vibrant. And part of that is prayer. There's this word selah that we see in the Psalms. We see it written here. Uh, We don't know exactly what it means. Uh, Many would point out that it's a musical term because many of these Psalms are songs and it's a musical term to take a pause. Others would really highlight that it's part of our spiritual rhythm in our walk with God. We have a Sabbath that we stop striving and we don't just do work 24-7, seven days a week. We step back. There's a pause, reflect, refresh, reinvigorate, reconnect with God, Selah, in the middle of an army coming to kill him, Selah. How do you Selah when the bills aren't paid, when you're waiting for the results from the doctor, when there's tension in your closest relationships, how do you just say, say la? Let's take a break and thank the Lord. Let's take a break and praise the Lord. We all have a choice when things are difficult. Here's the two roads, worry, worship. You can't go down both roads at the same time. Your legs can't spread that far apart. You're going down worry or you're going down worship. You decide the situation's not changing. You can't just change a situation. So you're gonna worry or you're gonna worship. David, in the moments where he was most tempted to worry, said, I will worship. And in the moments where you're most tempted to worry and complain and have despair, you've got to decide and declare, I will worship. I will thank God. I will confess my sin. I will intercede. I will listen to God. I will talk to God. I will praise God with all my heart. I will worship. That's David's decision. God is my only hope. You will either worship God or you will find someone or something else to worship. You are designed to worship. You are not designed to worry. God says over and over again, do not worry. You're made to worship. You will either worship Jesus, or you'll find some sad replacement. You'll find a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a spouse, a job, a hobby, finances. You'll find something to worship instead of Jesus. And the only way that your soul is gonna thrive is being close to God with your maker. There's no replacement. Nothing created can replace the creator. It's time to move out some of those idols and open up so the king of glory may come in. David, he played an instrument. Some people say he just had a harp by his bed. I don't think anyone in this room probably has a harp by their bed. I'm not saying that literally, but you might have your song list. Hey, Siri, hit that praise list for me one time. You might have your piano or your guitar. You might go to YouTube and find your worship video. Close to your bed, praise is on my lips. David, day and night, praise is on my lips. 
Why? Because the God, he says, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Be exalted, O God, above Saul. Be exalted, O God, above that army. Be exalted, O God, above those 3,000. God, be exalted above my problems. You are greater than my challenges. I'm gonna lift you up. You are more powerful. You are in control. I'm gonna give you praise. That's someone who's learning how to handle the situation when people are against you. He says in verse six, they spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. God will not be mocked. What you reap you will sow. You dig pits for other people, you're gonna fall into those pits yourself. Check out, well, you can look through uh, Mordecai, Esther, Haman, lives out that verse. Read the book of Esther this week. Jesus said this, and this is accounts from the Gospels in what was said to Jesus. In Mark chapter 11, verse 27 and 28, they arrived again in Jerusalem while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now, these are the religious leaders. These are the ones that have all the respect. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked Jesus, and who gave you authority to do this? Jesus faced constant criticism. Does anyone here enjoy criticism? No, thank you. Jesus constantly was criticized by the most respected. Jesus was criticized before he even did anything. It was a criticism that ultimately led to the crucifixion, and yes, he laid down his life for us. I'm not saying they had power to just take his life. He laid down his life. Don't miss that theologically. But they were criticizing him from the start. Now, this is what he says in John chapter 15 to the disciples. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If they love Jesus, they're gonna love it when you're bringing the gospel and sharing his word. If they don't love Jesus, they're already gonna be against you when you share God's word and God's truth and God's love. It's not primarily about you, it's about them and Jesus. And their relationship with Jesus will be revealed in your relationship with them. Jesus is saying, look how they treated me. Be ready. And David is someone who was persecuted. And notice with David, he was not derailed. He was not discouraged. He was not dominated. And he didn't let anyone's comments define him. He was secure. He set limits. Be secure because God has the final say with justice. You can be secure today as injustice is prevalent across the land. You can be secure today because God has the final say. David did not try to get revenge. Don't get revenge. Revenge is the Lord's. It belongs to him. It's not your role. Now, Saul went to relieve himself in this cave where David and some of the guys were. They could have killed him at that moment. And David said, no, don't touch God's anointed. And instead, just cut the hem of his garment. And they, they took that little piece. And then Saul finished. Saul left. And they said, Saul, why are you doing this? We could have killed you, but we didn't. And Saul recognized for the moment, wow, you're more righteous than I am. You didn't take revenge. You could have killed me. I've been trying to kill you many times. You could have killed me. You didn't kill me. Saul didn't come to his senses, but at the same time, they showed grace and mercy. The grace God has given to you, extend it to other people. The mercy God has given to you, extend it to other people. David, a man after God's own heart, said, who am I that I could receive so much grace from God and then go kill Saul? It's not gonna happen, guys. It's not gonna happen. He didn't get derailed. He didn't take revenge. He didn't stoop to Saul's antics. He stood his ground. He was realistic. Notice this. David did not go back to hang out around Saul. Just because you don't get revenge, it doesn't mean that you have to be good friends or stay close. 
David knew Saul was not safe. Saul was not safe, so he left. And he had distance and he had space. There's gonna be times when you need distance and space from someone because what they're saying and doing is really toxic and destructive. And you say, well, biblically, should I just get really close to them? No, biblically, the recommendation, if you read through the book of Proverbs, is to be discerning and give space and distance where it's right. And that's what David knew. That's what he did. And eventually, they're gonna be caught in their own devices, and that's what happened. David is on the run, and it might shock you that God's chosen one is homeless. David is on the run, just looking for a cave to spend the night. David is homeless. I think of Abraham, the patriarch. God said, go. Abraham left his comfortable home and land, and he went. He was really homeless in that sense. He's traveling. He's homeless. Sometimes the prophets, like Elijah, he was in a cave. But the prophets, what they cared about was being faithful to God. And if they were homeless, they were homeless. Jesus, the Bible says that the foxes have their holes, the birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. I'm trying to catch a golden thread here that including the Savior of the world, many godly people have been homeless, on the run, persecuted, mistreated. The church in the book of Acts, homeless, on the run, killed, persecuted. Many believers today, homeless, persecuted, on the run, but God is still with them. God is still with David. God's presence is more important than your possessions, than people's opinions, or any position that you have. It's more important than your home, your job, your title. Don't be chasing the wrong things or be too shaken when you don't have certain things because the most important thing, God is with him. Joseph was in prison and all you need to know about that, he was innocent, but the Bible kept saying, God is with him. God is with David. God is not so much comparatively with Saul. God is not with everyone in the same measure. God is everywhere. But God is not with everyone in the same measure. It's better to be homeless with God than to be in the palace rebelling against God. Welcome God's presence today. And that security, we have the victory. God does not call us to a a spirit of defeat. And it's like, well, just try to have a good attitude as we're all defeated. That's not our calling. God's calling is that he's revealed the end of the story and the victory is already won. The battle's already won. David is going to be king. It doesn't matter if Saul sends out 30,000. David doesn't have to walk around with, well, I guess I'm defeated and persecuted, but I'll just try to have a, a good attitude while I'm defeated. That is not God's call. Jesus is risen. It doesn't matter how many religious leaders or armies you put next to the grave. The stone will be rolled away. It doesn't matter how many skeptics there are today. The king of kings will return on the clouds, visible, physical. Jesus is coming back. You just can't stop that. You see, carry around God's victories in your spirit. Carry around God's victories when you look at circumstances. Don't walk in defeat. God has already won the battle. The psalm ends this way. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake my soul. Awake harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Not only be secure, but be steadfast in your faith because the Lord is faithful. Why be steadfast in your faith? Because the Lord is faithful. Billy Graham went to Cambridge, and he was going to speak not only to the students, but the professors, those and, and that were, you know, all had doctorate degrees, faculty, well-learned. He was intimidated. Has God ever called you to do something and it's kind of intimidating? 
You just have to admit that this is a little beyond me and my own strength here. And he went there by faith. The media in England blasted him before he arrived. They said, how is this man from backwoods America gonna come and talk to our brightest and best? He was to give a series of messages. And they said, how could this fundamentalist from America come and teach us anything? And with that intimidation, with that criticism, Billy Graham started to study. It was like a crash course in philosophy. And have you ever tried to do a crash course like you haven't been studying all semester and you know there's only like three days before the test? Okay, just me. Uh, and and he, was, he was pulling up, you know, Kierkegaard quotes. He was trying to sound extra intellectual. He was trying to put all the philosophy stuff together. And he did that for four nights. And that's not bad. We should know what we believe and why we believe it. We should be well read. We should learn and we should grow and be developed. But he was trying to bring this message and be extra heady to this crowd. And for four days, it just didn't resonate. Well, what happened on the fifth and final night? Billy Graham spent time in the Word and he brought a message. And again, there's a lot of liberal, call themselves Christians at this gathering who'd say, you don't need to be born again. You don't really need salvation. You don't need the forgiveness of sins. And that's all a lie. Billy Graham opened up the Bible starting in Genesis and Adam and Eve and as they rebelled and the sacrifice and the covering. And then instead of shrinking back or being silent, he went through every, going through scripture, the different books where there was sacrifice, there were animals, there was blood everywhere. And in, think, what in the world? Why would you be bringing this message of blood to these you know, intellectual people? Is this an offense? And what he was pointing out is that sin is serious and we've all sinned against a holy God. And the forgiveness of sins was just temporary covering through animals, but it was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. And he preached on the blood of Christ and the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross where the sinless Savior shed his blood for us and the blood is real. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. That the only way any of us have a chance for eternity is through the sacrifice of Jesus. Christ, the necessity of the blood, the substitutionary atonement, the only human who was perfect and God died in our place. 400 people came forward to trust Christ that night. 400 people. Because Billy Graham leaned into the gospel instead of just trying to be impressive intellectually, he leaned into the gospel, God who is faithful. There's power in the gospel of God, Jesus Christ is risen. And there was one skeptic that night that put his trust in Christ and people asked him later and he said, that was the first time in my life I realized Christ really died for me. Jesus died for me. There's no greater love. There's no greater sacrifice. Jesus died for us. See, as David praises God, now his faith is rising. His faith was low at different points. Maybe your faith has been low when people have been against you. But now his faith is rising. Faith encourages faith. That's in our relationships, conversations today. Faith encourages faith. Conversations at home, faith encourages faith. Faith grows. Faith is exercised. Faith is a muscle. Faith is developed. Faith encourages faith. Instead of a hard heart, if you have a hard heart, the grace of God, it, just a couple drops. But when you have a soft, a teachable heart, when you have an open heart to God, the grace of Jesus and the love of Jesus will flood your heart and your soul. And there's no greater abundance in life than the love and presence of God flooding your soul. Anyone today can open up their hearts to Jesus. With a grateful heart, this song comes forth. The circumstances have not changed. He's still in the cave, but his inner life has changed. Your circumstances might not change in this hour, but your inner life changes. God renews you on the inside, secure, steadfast, unwavering, continuing to move forward with a deep desire that God be glorified. Spend time 
Looking through Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Spend time, the Apostle Paul. Spend time, Stephen, in the book of Acts. Study and learn those who have been opposed but overcame in the strength of God. Be encouraged and inspired. Faith encourages faith. The truth in 1 Peter 5, 8. Yes, be alert, be of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But we know the lion of Judah who is greater than the devil, who has the final say, who will bring justice. And we can anticipate a victory like David. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses two and three, fixing our eyes on Jesus today. When people are against us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning at shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Be secure, be steadfast. In David's heart, his greatest desire is not God rescue me. His greatest desire is God be glorified in this situation. Would you make that shift today? Instead of God wipe out everyone who's against me, Instead of that, and you can pray that God will rebuke people, nothing wrong with that prayer, but is your greatest desire today, God, be glorified in this situation. We're gonna take a minute or two. Uh, you can reflect and pray. I put a couple of prayer requests on the screen. You can pray for yourself or pray for someone else. Pray for the purpose to know what is really from God, what God has called you to do as a parent, as a friend, with your gifts, your talents, this season of life, that your purpose would be clear. Pray for protection. God guarding you from the enemy, from the evil, from the darkness. And then passion, that God would reignite your flame to serve with joy and perseverance. Let's take a minute right now, looking at the screen, and prayers, our purpose, our protection, our passion. Let's go ahead and pray right now. Lift it up to the Lord, your purpose, so clear. God's protection, so powerful. Passion, that God would fuel, God would fuel you forward. You faced a lot of obstacles, opposition. Maybe you feel like you shrunk back to some degree. You're kind of hiding, you're kind of passive. Would you receive from the Lord today? Maybe you've got a hard heart today. Would you receive the Lord's grace and forgiveness today? Put your trust in Jesus for the first time today. What is God saying to you in this time, in this place, at this point in your life? What is God saying to you? What have you heard from the scripture today about your purpose and passion? Father, as we meet with you in this place, may you be exalted. That's the cry of our heart and in our lives. May you be glorified. Jesus, our eyes are on you. God, we pray that you would stoke the fires. You would bring the embers together. You would reveal and make it clear on our purpose. God, protect us. I pray we'd be courageous, bold, united, moved by your spirit today as we bow before you our holy God. We pray in your name, Jesus, amen.